For most of us, the vibrations of sound waves are relayed to the brain through the ear, which converts them to neural signals. As the sound hits the eardrum and it wiggles in and out, it sets up pressure waves inside a snail-like structure called the cochlea. The cochlea has hair cells lining it that are tuned to specific frequencies. So at one end, the hair cells only fire an electrical charge in response to low frequencies. At the other end, they fire an electrical charge in response to high frequencies, and of course, everything in between. So the signal goes from the ear to the brain stem and up into the brain. And that electrical charge goes to the auditory cortex, which is amazingly laid out in pitch order, almost like a piano keyboard. The hair cells are wired to the auditory cortex in such a way that you've got low notes stimulating this part of the auditory cortex on up to high notes stimulating this part. We used to think that there was a music center in the brain. We don't think that anymore. There are music centers and they're spread all over the brain. The auditory cortex activates as it receives signals from the brain stem through the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate nucleus. If you could look at all the different areas of the brain involved in extracting the signal from sound to turn it into music, you'd see a bunch of coordinated and a bunch of uncoordinated firing in different parts of the brain, kind of like a neural symphony, a neural orchestra. So pitch is processed in one set of neural regions, tempo in another, loudness in another, timbre, whether it's a violin or a trumpet or a human voice in yet another, and it all comes together later. The later in this case is maybe 30 thousandths of a second, so rapidly that you never knew the things were ever apart. Williams syndrome is a rare genetic disorder that causes developmental problems. People with the disorder have trouble reading and telling the time, but they do have an appreciation and a great talent for music. Here's Jennifer Scott. Stevie Wonder is one of Lisa Walsh's favorite musicians. She can sing along better than most people, capturing every nuance of his voice. To feel your heart like a dream was to ever do. She understands melody, tempo, even complicated heart. rhythms. Lisa may understand time in the context of music, but ask her what time of day it is, and she can't tell you. She has the coordination to play a keyboard, but she's unable to tie her shoes. These are just some of the contradictions of Williams syndrome, a genetic disorder that affects about 1 in 20,000 people. These individuals are missing several genes on chromosome 7, giving them a lower IQ, less hand-eye coordination, and physical traits like sloping shoulders and a turned-up nose. It's a mysterious gap in their DNA, and the role of most of these missing genes is still unknown. What is known is that some skills are remarkably preserved, like language and music. Rock your body right. Dan Levitin is in a unique position to study Williams syndrome. He's a former record producer and musician, now a psychologist. He's been working with Lisa for the past few years, trying to solve a puzzle. Why does music blast such a powerful pathway to the mind in people with Williams syndrome? If they can set these motor action sequences to music and they know the music and then just associate a particular movement, why should tying the shoe be more difficult than playing the clarinet or the piano? Um, they learn that when they want to create a certain sound, their finger has to do this and then this and then this on the piano. Um, and presumably they're matching these movements to a sound that's in their head. So if they can learn a song uh, in their head and just um, you know, link other movements, like tying the shoe, buttoning a sweater, or moving a fork, I don't see why that wouldn't work. Lisa was recently part of a groundbreaking study led by Dr. Levitin, 
For the first time, people with Williams syndrome had an MRI scan of their brains while they were listening to music and sound. The idea was to figure out which parts of their brains were active. And what they found may at least partially explain why people with Williams syndrome have such a profound connection to music. The subjects in the study, five people with Williams syndrome and five in a control group, were exposed to classical music by Beethoven and Bach. Then they were exposed to various noises, the sound of water, even of vacuum cleaners. People with Williams syndrome process noise differently too, not just music. In fact, for many of them, everyday noises actually sound like music. There's one boy, a 17-year-old, who asks for a vacuum cleaner every Christmas and every birthday because he loves the sound of them. And when the family went to visit us to do our study and we put them up in a hotel, they couldn't find the, the son one morning. And they looked all over and they find him three rooms down with the maid pushing the vacuum cleaner in the room because he loves the sound of it. And he can identify 15 vacuum cleaners by their model number. You know, he hears them and he goes, oh, that's a Hoover 9000. That's a Eureka XK75. Uh, so there's this interesting phenotype, this interesting behavior associated with Williams, which is this attraction to unusual sound and music. And that difference showed up here on the brain scans. This is a map that shows the areas of activation in the task where music was compared to noise response in both controls and Williams syndrome individuals. When the people listen to music and noise in the control condition, most of the activation is where we expected to find it, in the temporal lobe regions, the auditory cortex. Uh, and what you see immediately when you look over at the Williams group is that it's much more spread out. You've got activation in frontal lobe regions. You've got activation down here in the brain stem. Um, although it's different for every subject, every subject has um, a more diffuse and spread out pattern than the controls portion. People with Williams syndrome not only used more of the brain to process sound, they used unique parts of the brain, parts normally associated with emotion. The amygdala activation is something we didn't expect. The amygdala is a small structure in the center of the brain that uh, is associated with emotion in a variety of contexts. It modulates fear reactions, it modulates emotions such as happiness and sadness and our control subjects didn't activate the amygdala but our Williams subjects did and very strongly most particularly the right half of the amygdala the right hemisphere amygdala which indicated to us that yeah they're telling us they're feeling emotion and now we're seeing it in the brain as they're feeling it it's literally seen for the first time how these individuals are hearing and it appears that they experience music and sound just about everywhere in the brain. After a Williams syndrome person dies, um, an examination of the brain reveals a lot about the structure of the brain. And what we know from the few brains that we've been able to examine that way is that um, they have some structural features that are quite different from a typically developing normal brain. There are far fewer folds, uh, if you, you know, Typical brain is, is really a crumpled mass of folds and peaks and valleys. It looks a lot like a, a prune. Uh, and they have far fewer folds in their brain. And the um, uh, layers of the cortex seem to be structured differently. One part of the brain that seems to be structured differently is the cerebellar vermis located in the cerebellum. Some of it is smaller, some of it larger than normal. This is a key area in Leviton studies. So one possibility, although we don't know for sure, is that their brains uh, are built differently and maybe even wired differently. We're just beginning to do functional uh, studies where we bring them into the brain scanner and we try to figure out which areas of the brain are active during certain cognitive processes. And this will help us to understand better whether they use their auditory cortex in the same way we do. Uh, do, they, do they have other centers of motor control outside the, what we think of as the normal motor cortex. Those preliminary brain scans show some intriguing results. Dr. Levitin and his colleagues wanted to know what was going on in Williams syndrome brains when subjects listened to familiar music. The scans of these two people show brain activity taking place in that differently structured area 
called the cerebellar vermis. Scientists believe this region of the brain is the gateway to emotion and that it has strong connections throughout the entire brain. In the same study of normal brains, there was no activation in the cerebellar vermis, only a slight bit of activation in the frontal lobe. Dr. Levitin says that explains why they feel such an emotional connection with music. But he says there may be another reason. In his observations as both a professor and musician, Dr. Levitin says there's a key difference in the way the general population experiences music, like these students here, and those with Williams syndrome. Most people are inhibited when it comes to music, nervous about performing and feeling insecure. But those with Williams syndrome are not. And that lack of inhibition could be what's helping to forge a stronger connection in their brains. In the social domain, they're completely uninhibited. They'll run up to strangers and hug them. They uh, sort of say what they feel. So it may be that for reasons we don't yet fully understand, there's some sort of inhibition module in the brain that isn't turned up all the way in them. Lucky and them. They're able to get into the music because they're less inhibited. That inhibition module, if it does exist, isn't yet showing up on an MRI. But these brain scans of people with Williams syndrome are giving scientists a unique opportunity to connect the dots, from missing genes to brain function to human behavior. It's a biological roadmap being drawn, thanks in part to people like Lisa Walsh. From the bottom of my heart.